UT manual, but we're going to start looking at the integumentary system. That is our first section in the surgery section, right? Can anyone tell me if the integumentary system is bilateral? What is the skin? An appendage, right? Is it bilateral? Let's just think skin. We're not talking sides of the body because we're not talking musculoskeletal, are we? So is the skin bilateral? Yeah, yeah, right. No. The skin is not bilateral. So you would not add your LT or your RT modifiers for CPT codes that apply to procedures performed on the skin. Keep that in mind, because that is something where in the certification exams, you might actually get a question that has to do with that. But keep in mind, the skin is a covering. It's an appendage. It's, it's a covering of the body. So there is no laterality. <coughs> so in the integumentary system, we have three subsections which is the skin, the nails, and the breasts. Those are the three bodily systems that are represented in the integumentary system. I have a question. Sure. Shouldn't laterality apply to performed on the, um, procedures performed on the breasts? Yeah, there is laterality. Yeah. You have to keep that into consideration. Um, we're going to get there, but yes, because there is a left and a right breast, there is laterality to procedures that are performed for that. But it's, if we're talking just the, the skin itself, like removal of um, okay, lesions okay. or, right. Okay. So yeah, I keep in mind, I was going to get there, Matt. You're good. <laughs> I was going to get there. But yes, because there's a left and a right, later laterality does apply there. Um, with the skin, in the skin section, it ultimately contains a lot of procedures that are performed um, on the excision of lesions, uh, wound closures, skin grafts, the treatment of burns, um, debridement, debridement, I should say. What is debridement? What's that? Pressure ulcers. You may have a patient that has a pressure ulcer. And what is a pressure ulcer? Does anyone know? Another name for pressure ulcer? Bed sore. Absolutely. Sometimes, as medical coders, the information may not be right there for us to obtain whether or not, or assess whether or not. The pressure ulcer, there's four different stages. We're going to actually look at those, but there's four different stages. It may not be evident in notes for debridement. We may actually have to look at, they call them skin assessments. The skin assessment report is very, it's present in every single medical record because when a patient is admitted into a healthcare facility, they have new rules now that, of course, if a patient is admitted and they, perform, they don't perform a skin assessment and that patient arrived with a pressure ulcer or a wound from a different healthcare facility, it is now that facility's responsibility to, they don't get paid, you know? So of course, one of the first things that they do is conduct this assessment because they want to assure that it is not occurring within the hospital. They want to show that they are, that patient is getting provided with the care 
and that patient came into their facility with absolutely no type of injury to the skin, pressure ulcers, wounds, they, they want to make that assessment. If they don't make that assessment and that patient gets transferred to an acute care hospital for treatment, they're at the acute care hospital, guess who's still paying for that wound care? The facility that transferred them. So wound care has really become uh, a huge factor in coding and reimbursement because of the responsibility of the facility for that particular payment for wound care. It's not necessarily covered by third party payers. It's essentially covered more by that admitting facility. So as soon as people are admitted to a new facility, what's the, one of the first things they're gonna do is check that because it becomes their bill if they don't make a full assessment. So just keep that in mind. That documentation is present for that, that form. I tried to print some examples online and they were only about this big. So I do have a, um, a form that I actually created for a healthcare facility. I'll bring some examples next week so you can get an idea of what that looks like. Does anyone, has anyone ever seen a skin assessment form? They have what I call He-Man on them, you know, where it's the generic body and it's got the, the front and the back and, you know, each, everybody, a few of you are familiar, but uh, I call them P-Man. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll bring in some examples of that form so everybody can kind of take a look at that. But those are the skin assessment forms that are, are required at every type of healthcare facility. They're in the medical records. So remember when we talked about making sure we had that documentation to support the documentation is not always going to be on a report or an or, or operative note or a discharge summary. Sometimes you have to actually look for that documentation. What if the documentation isn't around? What do we do? What do we do if we can't find it? We've got certain diagnoses or a certain procedure that's performed but nothing to draw that linkage that we discussed. What do we do? Does anybody know? Do we just not code it? If we have a gut feeling as a coder, what do you think we would do? Anybody want to take a, a stab? Query the physician? Absolutely! <laughs> we query the physician. Has everybody heard of a physician query? No. Few? No. So you, you wouldn't go like to a nurse, you would go directly to the physician <coughs> that, um, that provided that service? Absolutely you talk to the physician because it's we're coding the documentation of the physician. So it's okay to kind of quiz them about it. Right. A lot of healthcare organizations will have a process for querying. They may have a query form where you complete the query form and submit it to the physician and then the physician responds back. It's a, it's a process or a procedure. Um, but if you're unclear about something, you never guess. You never assume, because we could be upcoding, undercoding, right? So we would query the physician. We would, we would reach out to the physician and say, you know, you have this, you have that. You state the facts for the most part. Would you ever request a medical record from like the department or something? You could. You could. Him and medical coders work hand in hand. <coughs> Typically what an HIM professional will do is they analyze the chart. They assure that there aren't any deficiencies in the chart. They make sure that all the I's are dotted, T's across, then pass that information along to the coder. What it is is a lot of healthcare organizations want to bill for that particular patient's stay within three to five days of discharge. When we have a health record, by law, there's 30 days to complete that record. If the record's not complete because of certain deficiencies, the physician didn't sign this, the physician didn't, you know. If there are specific deficiencies in there, it won't hold up the billing process. If that patient was discharged, typically a coder can code from the discharge summary, can code from, and there's other time frames, a discharge summary, a physician has 30 days to do it. But a lot of the times the coding will be based on operative notes, they have to be completed within 48 hours. There are guidelines, you know, in, in Barbara shaking her head, yes. Barbara did transcription, so she knows there are specific guidelines. In the olden days, they, they 
that doctors would just uh, not dictate within 48 hours. I think they're better now. <laughs> Now we have voice recognition yeah, yeah. software, so they, they are um, you know, trying to do it. It's, it's kind of a learning curve for a lot of the physicians to meet, meet all these regulations, but of course the facilities want, they want it built. They want that revenue for that particular patient. Did you have a question, David? Teddy, um, with the HR, I heard there was a law where the scribes now follow the doctors around and they're also MDs, so does that minimize the risk of missing information? It does. Um, scribes are actually just now being introduced into healthcare. Uh, a scribe is essentially a front-end transcriptionist that goes into the exam room with the physician. They have to have a background in medical coding. They have to have a background in, of course, the terminology. Joint Commission is only approving NPs and PAs at this moment to perform as scribes. A lot of healthcare organizations are having a hard time filling this particular position because they want to pay the scribe a secretary or they want to pay a lower rate of pay, but an NP or a PA say, ah, I don't think so. Exactly. Um, I read a really interesting article from the, the Joint Commission on the use of scribes, and they said that it essentially you're assigned to a position. So as a scribe, you follow that, that position so that you become accustomed with the position, you become accustomed to you know everything about that position. You know all of their cases. So any care plan meetings, you're involved with meeting with the family. You're, you are kind of the shell of that doctor. It's looking at 15 hour days, 16 hour days. You cannot miss any time. You cannot, I mean, it's, it's literally to the point where you really haven't seen these positions advertised at all. Yeah. And they want to pay them as like a second. $13, $15 an hour. Oh, it's an excellent point, David, because this is something that healthcare organizations are trying to work with the Joint Commission because, of course, the Joint Commission say saying the only people qualified to perform this role are NPs or PAs. But guess who's next in line to provide that role? HIM, the medical coders. More so the HIM aspect because we learn the medical terminology, the medical sciences, this and that. The pay scale is lower than an HIM professional's. So I think that they need to kind of tweak the responsibilities of that particular person. I'm gonna jot down to bring in the article that I had read, because um, last fall, or it was last summer, I was actually working with the Elliott Hospital on developing a certificate program for a scribe. And that's why I began to look into it, because Number one, what's, what's anticipated or required out there in industry, and it is something that's mandated by Joint Commission accredited facilities that they have to be an NP or a PA. So it's kind of, I cannot see an NP or a PA working those hours for that rate of pay. So, but I will bring in that article because that's an excellent, it is something that more and more healthcare organizations, perhaps those, those Policies or regs have changed because, of course, you know, this is something when they out service transcription. What a lot of these healthcare organizations found, and Barbara, you can back me up on this, but what, what had happened, I mean, it's really devastating what they did. A, a great, great friend of mine was working for, as a transcriptionist for a healthcare organization. She was there almost 30 years. She covered the transcription for uh, three of their hospitals. She had done this, you know, 30 years. I mean, she's pretty much getting to the point where she could retire. But what they did, 63 years old, they decided that they were going to cut her benefits, make her part-time, and have her work at each of the facilities, but under 40 hours at each facility. So she ended up working more than the 40 hours, but it, because it was separated throughout the network, 
She's working 60 hours a week without her benefits now. It was horrible. But what they've done with that particular field is they decided we would outsource these jobs. You know, they would use a telephone service, say on the weekends. When the, when the transcriptionists are in the healthcare organization, they queue their workload. You know, they have a queued workload. They do the reports that are completed during those hours on the weekends. Sometimes there are outside organizations that would do the weekend work, or the weekend work would be picked up by the transcriptionists on Monday. Let's save a few bucks. Let's outsource this work. Let's have it done elsewhere. 24-7 service. They did this. What's happening is then the transcriptionists become what they call medical editors. <coughs> so the work's being done, the transcription's being done, the reports are coming, but these reports are coming in, the transcriptionists don't know the local lingo. They don't know the physician's names. They don't know how to type the hospitals, the this, the that. They're not familiar. So what happens is the medical editors, transcriptionists have to go in and rework. Okay, now we're paying an outside organization, and we're paying the transcriptionists to do the rework. Are our reports being done timely? Oh boy. Let's start to re-insource the service. But by re-insourcing the service, that's where the scribes come in, because, okay, the patient's with the physician, and the physician's got the computer right here. Is that impersonal? Let's have someone else in the room with the computer so we don't lose that patient, physician, you know, kind of that, that, that well, personal feeling that you get when you're talking to your doctor and you're not looking at the Big Apple. Right, you know? but there's, right. But there's, speaking from the patient, I don't know how many other people feel this. Is that not an invasion of privacy? I was thinking, I mean, you know, some people have enough problem talk, just talking with doctors anyway. Right. You hear somebody else in there who's just. Right. Who's just and I think that's why the Joint whatever. Commission said it had to be an NP or a PA just to, to make the patient feel confident <coughs> to talk about private issues with their physician. And, um, but that is what they're, by insourcing, transcription into the healthcare organization. That's what they're beginning to propose this new role in healthcare as a scribe. A great point, great point. Can I just say something? Sure. Um, it takes a while to get used to uh, a position. when a doctor talks. And most of the things that are sent out, I think sometimes they're the most difficult doctors. And so the accuracy is, is kind of lost. I absolutely agree because, and that's where a lot of healthcare organizations have realized that, shoot, did we make a right choice when it comes to productivity? We wanted to increase productivity. I know at one point, one of the hospitals that I had worked at wanted me to do a productivity study and an analysis for the transcriptionists. And it was just, of course, when we are talking, you know, data, you can kind of make the data speak volumes in your favor, and in this case, in the favor of the transcriptionists, because you could see the work that was coming in from these outside, outsourced organizations, how much more time it took for the transcriptionists to complete the work. So it wasn't worth it in the long run. It may have looked good on numbers, but was it really beneficial? And from what I've heard, that a lot of healthcare organizations that laid off their entire transcription team, they're, they're actually starting to rehire and re-insource that particular profession. So, yeah. We need the documentation to code. We need the documentation to code, so. But great point, David, great point. Okay, 